Hi guys, welcome back to Your Own Watches. I'm Sam. Uh, we've been away for a while, but now we're back. Uh, I'm gonna have a video on my Tudor Oyster. So this is kind of the story of how I managed to get this watch. Uh, I got it for my 18th, or just after my 18th, as kind of a present to myself. Um, at the time, it was kind of the most expensive thing I ever bought. Uh, so I'm gonna talk you through how I did that, how much it ended up costing me, because it was a pretty good deal in the end. Um, and yeah, without further ado, let's, let's start. So this was one of my girl watches because I really liked vintage Oyster cases at the time. Uh, I saw a lot of like 1016s I really loved um, and stuff like that from Rolex and Cheetah. Um, as I was only 18 and I wasn't really looking for something impressive, I was looking for something kind of more classic and tasteful, I didn't want a Rolex. Um, so I legitimately prefer Tudor as a brand. Uh, and maybe still do, I'm only 20 now. Uh, I don't think I need a Rolex. Uh, it's not something I really aspire to yet. Uh, maybe once I get my first job out of uni um, or like I graduate well, I'll consider it and then I'll you know feel worthy of having one. Um, but this was just a self reward because I've been working at a pub uh, earning £65 an hour. Sorry, not at all £65 an hour. £65 a week uh, working a weekend job. Um, so I kind of scrimped my pennies uh, and took a load of birthday money out of my account, which is from, mostly from my grandma. So I found this watch on a site called The Sale Room, which is kind of a collection of real life auctions online. Uh, so if you see like an auction in real life and they have people on the internet, I guess some of that's coming from The Sale Room. Um, <laughs> the auction only had one really blurry photo and hindsight is twenty twenty. I probably wouldn't have bought it now. Maybe if it went cheaper I would have, but I kind of overpaid for this, uh, or at least I thought I did initially, because I won the auction for £350, and then plus auctioneer's fees, you're kind of looking at £454. Um, so it arrived, I had to kind of arrange to get it posted to me and everything. It's a bit of an ordeal, but not, not that at all. Um, and then I realized it came on a Rolex bracelet. Now, for those of you who don't know the history of Tudor, it's a sister company of Rolex. This one actually has um, a Rolex case, which is really nice. Um, I knew that going into it. And I had a suspicion that the bracelet was Rolex, but I, I didn't really know because I only had one photo. Um, but that did kind of save my butt. Um, so I ended up selling that bracelet for two around 200 pounds. I don't exactly remember what I let it go for. It was a 19 millimeter folded link uh, oyster, which are compatible with a load of vintage Rolex models and vintage Tudor models. So there was a market for it. I sold it on Reddit. I think I sold it on Reddit. Yeah, it must have been Reddit. Um, so that was a big chunk of money back, uh, which I was really happy about. So then I did further research into it. Um, I started talking to people on Instagram and even on Facebook, I think. Um, and I found out that the reason the bracelet didn't fit the lugs and didn't have the right lug pattern was probably because it was a replacement. Um, and then I also found out, because this one doesn't have the kind of correct case back you would expect. You'd expect one to be stamped uh, Oyster by Rolex, I think. Um, and this is a flat one with nothing on it, which I believe, well, it does actually have uh, some serial numbers on it, um, 7934 and another number under that. But I think this is an Oyster Slim case. Might be wrong, but that's kind of my understanding of it. And then the dial pans don't go with an Oyster Slim case, so it's probably service dial and service hands. They are real Tudor parts, which is nice, uh, but that detracts from the value of the watch, um, unfortunately. Doesn't bother me. It's not really a Frankenstein watch because it's service parts, pretty common for Rolex to do and Tudor to do. And it would have been a rose dial with, I think, dolphin hands, I was told. And those are pretty, but I, I do prefer the Tudor shield uh, and these kind of, are these batten hands, stick hands? Um, I think they're batten hands. Might be wrong. Um, but it has the 34 millimeter oyster case I was hoping for. It has a beautiful sunburst dial. The hands are in great condition. The tritium's all there. 
Uh, it's all pretty, you know, it's great condition, it's service parts. Um, the case isn't even bashed up, it's kind of micro scratches everywhere. A few bits scratched on the case back and like a dent, um, but that's fine by me. I don't look at the case back often, it's kind of boring. Uh, I wear the watch, I don't look at it. And as I was wearing this watch a lot, and as I got into university, um, I had a bit more money, uh, so I sent it off to get serviced. Uh, I, okay, I do remember, the one big flaw it had when I got it was a chip in the crystal about here, about 11 o'clock. Um, wasn't that noticeable day to day, it was probably like a few millimetres. Um, but then as it started to get worn and beat on more, that kind of spread into a crack around the edge of the crystal. And by the time I sent it to get serviced, uh, and I sent it to my friend Chris at Mornington Watches on Instagram, um, he said as he took the crystal off, it, it kind of just turned to dust. Um, so it's probably a good, good thing I got it done, which was cool because I saw the ETA movement for the first time. Um, it's a pretty basic movement. Um, you can't really expect much from an old ETA. Uh, it runs great. It was running great before I had it serviced, but uh, just better safe than sorry. Uh, and actually we found a cracked jewel in... I just don't remember where it was in the movement. But yeah, we found a cracked jewel in the movement uh, that got replaced and fixed. Um, and I, I really couldn't be happier with the longevity it's given the watch. Uh, it also got a flatter topped acrylic crystal instead of the kind of traditional domed. Uh, frankly, this has made it easier to photograph. The dome caught a lot of light reflections and was a bit funky. This, I don't know if it's completely flat. It's got a little bit of curve on the top. It's got a beveled edge to the crystal, which is really nice. And it just gives it a more modern look, which I really enjoy. Anyway, if you do the math here, um, this cost me 454 with auction fees, which is quite a bit for this watch in hindsight. If I was just buying it like this, I'd be like, eh, it's a decent deal if it was serviced. Um, but then obviously the bracelet was 200 pounds right back in my pocket. Um, and then I spent 100-ish, probably a bit less than 100, I don't exactly remember, on servicing. Yeah, because I definitely had a few more watches done at the same time, like crystal replacements, battery replacements, because I just sent them to crystal at the same time, so he gave me a great deal. The other thing that's improved this watch and really made it a keeper for me has been strap choices. So I have a few of them here. Um, yeah, okay, so these are the two straps I wear most. I have a old, really cheap NATO strap, which really should be replaced. Um, Ark and Jack, Adrian, if you make a 19mm NATO strap, I will buy it first. Uh, I just bought my dad on your NATO straps for his Bremont. Shh. His birthday's on Sunday. I'll probably release the video on Sunday and hopefully I'll have it by then, or he won't watch this video. Either or. Um, but I'm really impressed with how those NATOs look and I'd love one for this. Um, other than that, I was thinking a Chevron NATO strap might be a good replacement for this thing, but it's, well, honestly, it's a bit grimy right now. Um, I made it actually a Zulu strap, I cut it off, um, but it, it got worn on that quite a bit. Uh, I also had a really cheap leather strap, which was like £15 genuine leather, pretty, well, yeah, noticeably bad leather quality, um, and like the siding paint or whatever was coming up onto the strap, and it just wasn't nicely made. I wore on that probably like a half dozen times before I changed just to the NATO. Uh, and then a couple of years later, I got this nicer top grain leather strap. It's real soft. Um, gets worn on this a fair bit. But now this has started to let go as well. There's the leather keepers are kind of starting to, to come apart. I think it's just like 25 euros, which was a decent price. Um, I want to find this watch a forever strap. So if you guys have any recommendations, I'm thinking currently like, a Molican, like spending, I'd be happy to spend 100 pounds, 100 euros on a nice strap for this because I think it deserves it. Uh, I was thinking this kind of a brown like this, maybe a bit lighter. This has got darker as I've worn it, as most leather straps do. Um, maybe a grey, maybe something more interesting. Let me know below, um, like comment, links, suggestions. I don't know if you can comment photos, that'd be great, but I think you can on YouTube. Um, and I'd love to hear your suggestions for straps because I really think it deserves a good one. Um, did I talk about 
And then NATO straps, I've been looking at, besides Bark and Jack, hopefully they'll release a 19 mil this year. If not, uh, Crown and Calibre have them on their Chevron straps. Which are really expensive for NATO straps, but I've heard some really good things. So I might make the jump for one of those if I find one that suits this watch enough. Um, I don't think a two-tone strap would work. I think I want a solid color, maybe a charcoal gray or a light gray, either or. Um, so let me know your suggestions for those as well. I'm probably going to go through the, uh, the website here and, and look at Chevron straps and show you guys things I like. Um, let me know any straps you think might be good. They don't have to be Crown or Calibre or Mulligan. They can be, you know, whatever um, strap manufacturers you guys like. Just let me know. I'd rather spend more for the quality than just like a look. Um, yeah, so that's the story of how I got my Tudor Oyster at 18. Uh, it's still a grail piece of mine. I really couldn't let this go. It's 100% a Kiva. I know we've spoken about Kivas before on the podcast, but this is like... This is a definite keeper. This is like a probably, probably, probably keeper. Um, my SKX is like a probably keeper. But, um, yeah, the tutors are non-negotiable. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed that little story and maybe you can learn a bit more. Um, I definitely recommend checking out the Sarah Room. That's just fun. You find some like really weird stuff on there. I found a vintage Tissot clock at one point. Uh, I lost the video on that, which was really annoying because it went for like 75 pounds. Um, but anyway, hope you guys have a good day. Uh, like this video because we're back. We're on back. We're going to do more podcasts, uh, more reviews, more of whatever we can do during Pier 4. That's kind of what's been holding us back, uh, along with my university work, to be honest. Uh, anyway, you guys have a good day, and I'll see you in the next video.